Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We'd love to see you. Yes, folks, today we have a very difficult show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's to yeah. put it uh, lightly. I think uh, this one's going to be a real challenge. <laughs> yeah, but before we get into it, uh, please like, comment, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Yes, yes. Check out the website, eigenbros.com, eigenbros on Instagram, eigenbros on Twitter, eigenbros2 on TikTok, and also thank you. Thank you to the patrons. So, of course, uh, you guys, you know, we couldn't do this without you. We we greatly appreciate the support. Um, and you, too, can become a patron at patreon.com slash eigenbros. And yes. there you'll get an extra 30-minute podcast every week on random crap that me and Juan will uh, think about <laughs> during the week. <laughs> yeah, so uh, today we'll be talking about Yang Bill's theory. Yeah. Money. Cha-ching! <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think his name is... Um, uh, uh, what is it? C, uh, Chen Chen Ning or something? I don't know, but <laughs> but Yang Yang Mills theory. It's one of these uh, uh, gauge theories. Um, well, before we start throwing jargon all over the place, <laughs> yeah, this just, is why we're. This is why this could be a challenge. Yeah. This is like uh, <clears throat> it's really hard to distill this concept down for some reason. Yeah. So me and Terrence, we just kind of want to give you the 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 punchline first. Sure, we sure. Want, we're going to throw up some equations up at you. Hopefully, you're not assaulted <laughs> or uh, harassed, and you're like, I'm not going to. They're, if they're uh, if they're in physics or math, they're used to being assaulted <laughs> <laughs> by equations. Yeah. Mentally assaulted <laughs> yeah. on a daily basis. We'll throw it's the fine. equations up there because they're a little bit. Uh, they're going to be really challenging to describe, but yeah. um, but there's a, a more compactified or compact form. Of the Yang Mills equations, there are two yes. sets of equations. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we'll throw them. On yeah, the we'll throw them on the board here. here. Yeah. But for the audio listeners, uh, <clears throat> we'll give you the really compact form because we're not going to sure. go through all the subscripts here. <laughs> sure. So the real compact form here, and this is um, courtesy of a great resource by Michael Nielsen. You guys have may have seen him. He's got a YouTube channel. He's on Twitter. Um, pretty online science dude. I think he's a physicist. Not sure though. You should check me on that. But um, Michael Nielsen has a little intro he wrote up on michaelnielsen.org on Yang Mills theory, and I would highly suggest you check it out. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can link it even in the video if I remember. So his first equation is little d, so that's lowercase d, subscript capital D, f equals zero. So that's the first equation, and then the next one is a Hodge star operator acting on lowercase d sub capital D Hodge star f equals j. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, there's there's some explanation here, like uh, the d sub d is what's called an exterior exterior covariant derivative. Um, well, Nielsen describes the the capital D as mm -hmm. containing most of the information yes yeah, so, it's got the connection yeah so capital d is uh called the connection um yes. and which tells us how to move stuff around from point to point on uh, on a manifold and there's a bunch of other jargon that we're going to get into but i'd like to just kind of lay the foundation first yeah. on what the hell a connection is sure uh, the manifold which you know kind of describes um it kind of has a, a sort of some relation to the curvature because uh, they talk about the curvature and it's a compact mm. form of a tensor and all this other stuff. And So I believe the curvature is contained within the term, the F term yeah, in yeah. Nielsen's paper. Yeah. So really the meat of the whole thing is mostly the connection mm -hmm. and then F contains the curvature. Mm -hmm. And then in the second equation, you'll see the J, which has to do with current. Um, I don't know what exactly what the current is. Um, entails, but I know it entails like charges and you know the velocity of the charges, and I guess yeah. a collection of charges. It's like a physical. So it's like history. a current that you would think yeah. normally. So yeah. it's not so bad on the surface, except it took me forever to even find a resource that even had <laughs> <laughs> a simple version of this equation. So yeah, um, you will notice that if you do try to look up Yang Mills theory, there's a lot of um, mystery behind what it actually is, especially if you don't know topology, gauge theory, mm -hmm. um, group theory, or any yeah. of these other mathematical um, frameworks. Yeah, yeah. And so the connection, so I, I kind of wanted to add that, like, 
it, the connection tells you how to move stuff around from point to point on yeah. this like manifold. And typically like in physics, the manifold you'll be dealing with is the Minkowski, Minkowski uh, space time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which in GR, you if you've done GR, you'll, you'll probably know like, or you'll probably be, be very familiar with it. Right, um, right. So, <clears throat> well, and then for the layman, of course, it's not anything that really great. It just literally means like flat space, like a surface. So just think of a surface. That's all yeah. Minkowski space is. Yeah. So, and, and I guess you're like, what else is there? If you want to know the antithesis, there can be things like curved space. So there's all kinds of different curvatures that you can allow for mm-hmm. space time. But Minkowski space is the tried and true, straight up flat space time. Yeah, and then this, and then this formulation. Uh, the connection is, or this D, this capital D, mm-hmm. is what is the field that gives rise to the fundamental physics. Yes, it's this vector field. It and that, contains the vector. It potential, contains the vector yes. potential, and that that's kind of the most important one because that's when we start talking about gauges. Right, and if um, you guys are familiar with E and M, like some of you, I'm sure, have taken undergraduate E and M, you get to um, gauge theory and that I think first. Yeah. Did you get to gauge theory first in E and M one when no, you were no. in undergrad? What no. was your first class with it? Uh, we literally just did potentials. Oh, but you never even got to gauge theory. We yet. got to gauge at the very end of the class. No, but I'm saying is that the first class that you've taken? Oh, sorry, yes. That had gauge theory. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was the only class I took that had gauge theory. I think, and then yeah. and then maybe um, was there anything else? No. Yeah, I think that was it. So um, you first get introduced to gauge theory in E and M. Um, and of course, that's the classic um, magnetic field is equal to del cross A for the people who know the mathematics out mm-hmm. there. And that's the um, the vector potential right there. So A would be the vector potential. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll show we'll show some uh, we'll show a video, but we'll also play some audio regarding this to, to elaborate more. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of the meat and potatoes of the whole thing, like the physics of it, choosing a gauge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this kind of has to do with symmetries. Um, and you will see, hopefully it'll make more sense as we tie it all together. But I wanted mm-hmm. to play this video um, of why gauges and symmetries come into play when you're talking about Yang Mills. And this right. is kind of the underlying reason why. And I'll go ahead. We'll go ahead and play the video. All right, let's do it. Stays the same. We oh, mean the to, equation. Uh-huh. You need to hold it up to the mic. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um... yeah, yeah. Hold on one second. In the case of Noda's theorem, when we say the environment stays the same, we mean the equations that give the laws of motion for the system. For example, moving along a perfectly flat road, the downward force of gravity stays constant. We have symmetry to spatial translation, and Noda's theorem tells us there's a corresponding conserved quantity. That quantity is momentum. If two cars collide on that road, the sum of their combined momentum stays the same. But what if the road is hilly? Momentum doesn't appear to be conserved. It can be lost or gained to the gravitational field. This is because the direction of the gravitational field changes with respect to the road. It's not symmetric to translations along the road. On the other hand, the gravitational field across the whole stretch of road doesn't change from one point in time to the next. The system is symmetric to time translations. It doesn't matter when the collision happens, the results are the same. Notice theorem reveals that this time translation symmetry gives us energy conservation. And the last classic example. If the f- so I kind of wanted to highlight here, like they choose that you notice how first you had a flat space, right? Right. You had a flat vector space and it just, you had the arrows pointing all in the same place. So yep. those are vectors for those of you that aren't familiar. The arrows were for representing what though? Um, Just the, I guess the curvature in this, in this, okay, like the direction sure. of the curvature, I guess. Okay, um, sure. So he's just using a vector field to demonstrate how the vectors, the tangent vectors can change or something. Yeah, like this. yeah. Okay. On this, on this manifold, because they had a two surface. They had okay. A, they had a surface. So in this case, like the vector potential um, was just flat at first, and then you kind of just saw how it translates symmetrically, and the physics doesn't change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one, they showed that, you know, the curvature, they changed the curvature, so now it's more bumpy and hilly and stuff. Right. So now the, the vector potential changes. So mm-hmm. the vector tells you where things 
or how things are behaving, but if fundamentally a lot, there were symmetries still that were sure. weren't being like um, how would you say conserved? Yeah, or that invariant. Were, yeah, they were okay. being invariant. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. when they're conserved, things aren't changing, and that's and when they move through space, that's what we typically can denote by saying, or physicists denote by saying invariant. Right, and there's actually. Um, a very important thing called Nether's theorem, which mm -hmm. pretty much encapsulates the whole relationship yeah, between this is, symmetry and invariance. Yeah, so, and this is what the video is from, actually. So okay, this, yeah. Yeah, this video is called Net Nether's theorem and the symmetries of reality. Yeah, so that's a non-obvious <clears throat> thing, especially if you're not um, far along in physics, I guess. Um, it may feel intuitive, but at the same time, it's not super obvious. Um, it's just that... Nerther showed that if a, if a system has a symmetry, a particular symmetry, along with that symmetry will come a conserved quantity. Yeah. So that's not obvious, but I guess an example of that would be like if there's, um, uh, what's it, uh, if there's time invariance, so that's when if your object or something um, doesn't change over time, then that means there's an energy conservation or there's a, there's a conservation of energy along with that system. So that's what Nerther's theorem, I guess, basically proved. Mm -hmm. And Yang and that, and that ties in with Yang Mills and gauge theory and this stuff because it basically, these theories all utilize these kind of real fundamental mathematical um, frameworks of symmetry to show that you can actually cons you can actually construct these whole systems just based on having these certain symmetries, and then I guess a little bit of physics tied to it. Yeah, yeah, and the the, the takeaway here is like how we when we talk about the vector field, so pay attention to that because that's in that case the gauge, like you're choosing a gauge to talk about, and it, and and so like the, the, you're gonna hear so that term choosing a, lot. a gauge mean one. So choosing a gauge, it's like choosing a vector potential. So you choose. Can you give an example of what a vector potential would even be? So a vector potential is going to be, I guess, in in the most um, colloquial way, I guess, mm -hmm. if you have no reference of physics, yeah, you can sort of think about how, um, let's say you're playing in the grass. Sure. It's very tall grass. Okay. The blades of grass are these vector arrows, right? Okay. So whenever a wind blows, we'll choose the wind as being the vector, well, the force that changes the vector, um, the, the the blades of grass. Right, so the sense. blades of grass you're saying would represent the vectors everywhere yeah. in space. Yeah, yeah. And I guess space would be the ground. Yeah. Okay, and then the wind would blow all these grass blades, Yeah. and then all of the blades shift to a certain direction. Yeah. Okay. Depending on where the force is. So like the wind itself is the force, but in physics, we like to generalize forces to potentials. So we do that. I mean, and, and by definition, like there's a mathematical one. Force is equal to the spatial derivative of the of the potential or the gradient of the potential, right? You remember that one? F is equal to yeah, yeah, negative. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so we deal with this in classical mechanics, but um, but you can get the expression of the force from the potential. Yes, and for, yeah. for people who aren't aware of potential, you can just think of it as gravity. So gravity yeah. would be an example of potential. Yeah. So we're in a gravitational potential at all times when we're on Earth. Yeah. So the thing that's pulling you down is basically the force of gravity, but we can, we can say, um, go a layer deep and say that it, there's a potential field from gravity exactly. due to the mass around us. Yeah. So the Earth actually has gravity because it has mass. So the Earth is so massive that we have a, a, a yeah. enough gravity to actually hold us down. Yeah. And we're in a potential well, you could think of that as. Yeah, and you get more information from vector fields than you do from just a force equation. Because, like, imagine yeah. if you get the, yeah, because if you get a layout or a view of the field and the curvature of the field, then you can kind of get these, your equations of motion from that. Yeah, yeah. And we'll go more into why this is, but... Um, I just wanted to play this other video from PBS Space Time um, called Quantum Invariance. It kind of goes into a little bit, a little bit more about um, gauge, uh, gauges and stuff. Okay. So here we go. We introduced the idea of a gauge theory. 
In simple terms, a gauge theory is one that has mathematical parameters or degrees of freedom that can be changed without affecting the predictions of the theory. An example would be a ball rolling down a hill under a constant gravitational acceleration. The speed of the ball at the bottom of the hill depends on its change in altitude. But it doesn't matter what we define to be altitude zero, the bottom of the hill, sea level, even the center of the Earth. For the equations of motion of the ball, the altitude zero point is irrelevant. It's what we call a gauge freedom or a gauge symmetry. And we say that the equations of motion are invariant to that parameter. That's a pretty basic example, but it turns out that these gauge symmetries are an important feature of most of our physical theories describing the universe. Newton's laws of motion and gravity, Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism, Einstein's general relativity, and of course, the standard model. We're not quite sure why this is the case. So yeah, he, he just kind of explained a little bit more about why gauges, uh, gauges are, are important to modern physics. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of not even a thing that you would care about if you're a layman, I don't think. No. Because <laughs> you kind of have to do math to even care what a gauge theory is. Like when we would see like Joe Rogan uh, ask Lawrence Krauss or yeah. Eric Weinstein what gauge theory is, I'm kind of like, who cares? It, it doesn't really matter for him. If you're a layman no, and yeah. you don't know what gauge theory is, it's not really that relevant to you because it's all about symmetries and things, which you only care about if you're doing the math, because yeah, it's like because you're oh, trying to simplify things. Yeah, it's like oh, we can we can we can't solve these equations in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. So we use math tricks to be able to solve this thing by by using like symmetries and arguments of arguments of symmetry to solve this equation in a way that actually gives us an answer that we can utilize. Um, yeah, and like I don't know. Did, so this is another one of those weird things. The what is it called? The um, like the choosing the name of shit like ch they chose the name gauge theory because uh because of some railroad shit oh really <laughs> yeah so so from what i read yeah uh was that so when they used to build railroads they used to choose so you had different size gauges yeah um, for the um yeah for putting down the yeah, the, the, the things I don't know things. what you're saying. <laughs> the pin. They're yeah, like, so you. gauges the are these like pins, I think, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that you pin down to the railroad so that you can just pretty so much. It, so it can uh, hold together. Yeah. 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 So the thing is, you can have different gauges for the, for the railroad track mm -hmm. that you can use different gauges and it was, you could still use the railroad track. It didn't matter what gauge mm -hmm. you used. Mm -hmm. You just used it and then that was fine. Okay. You, you yeah, would yeah. get the same outcome. You would you would still be able to use the damn railroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind okay. of I, I, I th this could be one of these uh, <laughs> antiquated uh, names. Yeah, <laughs> I like it though. It sounds cool. It sounds cool, but <laughs> I also don't know if that's actually the theory. This might of uh, uh, the name or the what is it? Damn, I'm, I'm blanking on the word. There's the um, the. Uh, yeah, I'm coming off of a, a flu uh, spike from my second COVID shot, so yeah, a little yeah. bit. Wants my brain is like that. rattled, but <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to find the name. It'll come to me later. But anyway, yeah. the etymology of the oh, gauge. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, there you go. The, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so that, I don't know if that's the true etymology of, of the or, or the origins of the word, because uh -huh. I think people have just said it, and I'm like, this might be one of those things that people were just running with. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like they just came up with afterward. Yeah. 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 But the Maybe. idea is that the idea is that you can choose any gauge and you're still going to get the same physics. Yeah. Out. And that's what, that's what we mean by gauge invariant. Like, right. Yeah. Right. So you, if you're a layman, don't care that much. Yeah. Just know it has to do with symmetry. And, uh, yeah, you, you really don't, aren't going to care that much. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be able to tie it into why, like I, we're just kind of explaining why physicists, the bigger picture is, is you're trying to simplify things, yeah, uh, or trying to reduce it down to the to the simplest element yeah. where you can get the most information. Yeah, the further physics goes, in some sense, we're getting pushed more and more to the abstract layer of mm. mathematics. Exactly, because mathematics really is everything at the end of the day, right? Mm. And as things get harder and more deep, it's like we're relying on those abstractions and the mathematics to even be able to understand how the universe works because you know at those extremes and those edges intuition fails 
you mm-hmm. you can't really rely on intuition anymore. You have to just go with the math and the way that you elucidate and yield more, you know, more understanding of things is to be able to have more math. Yeah. So we're at the level of now trying to find all these real deep fundamental parts about the universe, symmetries, you know, how things are invariant and, mm-hmm. you know, all this stuff by just figuring out the math and, you know, the underlying kind of structure of things. Yeah, this kind of also this episode would be good if you like are so confused about what the hell gauges are. <laughs> now that <laughs> yeah. I think about it, like if you're an undergrad, like I was also an undergrad, like what the fuck are yeah. gauges? Even after I did gauge theory, I barely even knew what it was. It's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but I have this great video. If you're still, this kind of puts for me. This put a nail in the coffin for like what mm. what I didn't. If I didn't know what gauges were, this kind of gave me a good realistic picture of what it is. Yeah. Okay. So, Good, good. This will this will be good for you folks. Hello everyone. Today I will talk about the elusive concept of gate variance. We'll begin with a simple analogy from first year mechanics. Suppose I stand on a desk and drop a ball from some height y. The potential energy of the ball is given by V equals MGY with respect to the ground. I can find the force on the ball, which is the derivative of the potential energy, and we get the following equation of motion. Now, let's say I want to do the same experiment on top of a mountain of some height. Why not? By the way, the equation of motion is uh, the force of gravity. For those of you that don't know, you start with the potential mgh. Um, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you just end up with uh, the downward force of gravity here. Yeah. Well, that would mean that with respect to the ground, my potential will change by some constant v naught. Well, once again, we can find the force, and we get the same result and the equation for the equation of motion, since v naught is just a constant and its derivative is zero. So the upshot is that we get the same equations of motion even though our potentials are different. This captures the idea of gauge invariance. Hermann Weyl was the first to introduce the term gauge invariance into English. It comes from the German term eigenvariance, or invariance under the change of scale. You can think of the quantity v naught as our gauge in this case. We have the freedom of selecting the origin of our coordinate system. This is known as gauge freedom. The type of gauge changes based on the context that you're dealing with, and we see different gauges in the context of electromagnetism, general relativity, and field theory. If a system is invariant under a particular type of gauge transformation, it means that the physics of the system don't change under that transformation, and the equations and motions remain the same. Gauge freedom often allows us to express our equations in a simpler form while still preserving the physics of the system. For example, we can just set V naught to zero in our example earlier, and it doesn't change the dynamics of the falling ball. We will now move... So, yeah. I mean, that kind of highlights nicely what we were saying, yeah. Yeah. So it's just a nice way to make the math work at the end of the day. Yeah. (laughs) That doesn't change your system at all. Right, right. And it's like... Yeah, the utility of it, you you don't see, especially whenever, like, we were introduced to it in, in E&M. Yeah. I didn't see the utility of it because they just kind of throw it at you and they're just like, you know. Well, I saw it in the sense that I knew that we can solve certain equations because I don't think we could solve certain things without it. Um, but, yeah, I was just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it was such a huge part of modern physics and like you know yang mills theory and Mm -hmm. stuff you know and and of course we didn't know quantum field theory either so i didn't know anything about gauges in quantum field theory as well yeah so it's a big part of like the leading edge of physics Mm -hmm. like modern theories yeah yeah so we're talking about gauge theory so much it's because it's so important to the modern day landscape physics yeah including uh yang mills theory Mm mm-hmm yeah, so um, so Sum now that you – hopefully now that you kind of have a good conception of what the hell gauges are, it, it's yeah. a lot more clear in like the language of Lagrangians um, mm-hmm. because in Lagrangians, at least in the – what I mean by that is like the energy formulation for those of you that don't know. The Lagrangian is this uh, – it, it's a mathematical tool that physicists use to – It's basically like – the end all be all for like equations of motion equations yeah like it's like the master equation that you always want to get in terms of finding what you want in physics like 
everybody wants the Lagrangian. Unless you're doing like quantum mechanics, it's like the one exception. But the Lagrangian yeah. is everything pretty much. Yeah, Lagrangian gives you the equations of motion. You know, the ex- you can get the velocity and the position. Yeah, from that. But that's everything, right? Because you yeah. want to know how a system um, unfolds. Uh, unfolds Moves, over time, yeah. right? Yeah. So the Lagrangian is literally everything. Like the standard model can be written in terms of a Lagrangian, and then that Lagrangian should, in theory, tell you everything about how the universe works. Mm-hmm. So that's like the master equation that you always want, pretty much, in terms of any kind of physics you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And and I kind of wanted to give this little quick snippet by Sean Carroll. Um, he has a good little lecture series. Um, mm-hmm on this uh <laughs> that we were watching the other day yeah uh <laughs> we we're both kind of laughing well, well i'm not i'm not gonna point out yeah yeah <laughs> but, but uh Maybe you can listen to the patreon and we'll say something about yeah it. <laughs> but sean but sean's sean carroll's uh lecture is pretty good he uh he kind of goes over this little nugget of information here that ties into yang mills that i thought was really uh really enlightening oh, okay um okay. so here we go we'll, we'll go ahead and play but he ties it into the lagrangian formulation and tying it into sort of the yang mills mm. kind of formulation okay or the, the differential geometry all right cool let's see right oh you forgot to restart yeah if if we want to have this gauge symmetry we need this connection field the photon field it needs to have its kinetic energy, okay? And that we just need to invent from scratch. So there's a long story that I'm gonna make very, very short. The kinetic energy of a gauge field, which is the connection, right? What can I say? Comes from, is made from, uh, comes from Well, what could it possibly come from? What do you have when you have a connection lying around? If you remember the video, the idea that we did on geometry, connection is a way to parallel transport things. And by parallel transporting something, we find out how it changes uh, around a loop, if that's what we want to find. And that gives us something called the curvature. In space time, it was called the Riemann curvature tensor. So guess what? If you're not a space-time symmetry, if you're an internal symmetry, there's still a curvature. You can still take that quark field in red, green, blue space. You can parallel transport it around a loop. It will be rotated in general. You can make that loop infinitesimally small, and you're going to construct a curvature. And the curvature, unlike the connection field itself, is gauge invariant. It is something that can be written in a very simple way. It's gauge covariant, technically. I, sorry, I apologize for all the technical um, footnotes here, but I want to talk to people who know this stuff already and to people who don't. Um, it, it transforms nicely under gauge transformation. So it comes from the curvature. I hope that's the right spelling of curvature. And that is the nugget here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the payoff. The field I think. comes from the curvature, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so the kinetic energy of the gauge or the connection field comes from the curvature. So, this is if you've taken GR, it's kind of like, oh, cool. I see. I can see that because then your manifold is uh, space time, Minkowski space time. Okay. And so flat space is yeah. what you're working in. Yeah, and then now that you have a gauge, you have some kind of. Uh, like potential field. Right. So yeah. if you have a gauge, now you have now you have invoked some kind of curvature onto your space. Yeah. Is what yeah, you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of, and that's well, I guess like, you have a field, we'll say. You yes. don't necessarily have to have curvature. I guess I guess if you have a field you have curvature then, right? That's what yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what yeah, that's what he, right. that, that's what that's the, basically the takeaway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying to I'm trying to translate for a layman oh, at the gotcha, same time gotcha, while gotcha. you speak, my bad. <laughs> no, true. But but I will say like when you put so it's easier to see that because whenever the kinetic energy, whatever, m- or motion in a sense coming from yeah. that, it like you drop a mass or something in, in this curvature and you see the motion, you get the kinetic energy, yeah. right? It's easier to see that in that picture. And I guess we should make the caveat that it's not necessarily space that's curved, I don't think. It could be the, like, in quantum field theory, they're saying, like, everything has its own field, 
mm-hmm. which I guess is its own manifold. I'm not sure. Now I'm really reaching, so put a big we'll, stash we'll, we'll put more. We'll put more on the on the. Uh, there, there's another video that kind of addresses this. A little yeah. Bit. yeah, this makes sense intuitively if you think about it. But the thing is, we know that um, gravity is the thing that we consider as bending space. Not like E and M, like electric, electromagnetic um, fields are not bending space time. No, so you can't think of that as curved space. So it's like what I think is it's saying is if you have an electromagnetic field, for example, the the space that's bending is the electromagnetic field um, uh, space. Yeah. So in quantum field theory, everything has its own field. Yeah. So if I guess if you if you try to extrapolate the field as its own geometry, then you can say that 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 space for the electromagnetic field is curved, which gives you a potential. But mm-hmm. you can't say that's the space time because that's that's um, reserved for gr general relativity. Yeah. 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 True. Yeah. So hopefully so this be, kind we, of we have to be careful sometimes with what we're saying here. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this kind of explains like it ties more into the classical language. Uh, that most undergrads are familiar with, like the Lagrangian language, mm-hmm. to this sort of Yang Mills language of, or like just talking about gauges serving as a connection and how it ties into the curvature. Right. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, this this was uh, this was probably the most illuminating thing um, for me, at least. Uh, this mm-hmm. little nugget here, but uh, to tie it all in. Uh, we can continue on the the origin of the standard model. We're going to go back to this PBS space time video mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> that kind of ties into how we got uh, the the sort of standard models. We 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 start introducing these uh, phases and stuff into yeah. into um, into our picture because we're trying to get a more realistic picture like mm-hmm. quantum mechanics is kind of this like like very at least standard quantum mechanics is like this toy model you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. because you don't have relativity included you yeah. know it, it, and it's only redu- and it's only for massive fermions right mm-hmm. that's just like protons or electrons mm-hmm. as opposed to like light um, particles photons yeah so yeah it's like it's re- it's constrained to a small subset of stuff yeah, and, and you want a more general f- theory that yeah. captures a, a lot of physics. Like you, right. Yeah. So this is kind of what um, quantum field theory is. At least that's what yeah. the... Uh, it's the evolution. Yeah. To At least that's what you quantum, want. Quantum, because it includes relativity now, or at least special mm. relativity, right? Mm. Yeah. So hopefully this will be more illuminating. Let's Let's go but it seems to be a trend. A theory that has these gauge symmetries is called a gauge theory. Today, we're going to look at the simplest of the symmetries of the standard model. The standard model is ultimately based on quantum field theory, but we're going to use the Schrodinger equation. That's the most basic equation of motion of quantum mechanics. It describes the evolution of the wave function, which is the mathematical object that contains all the information about a particular physical system. We could never see the underlying wave function of, say, a particle. The best we can do is make a measurement of physical observables like position or momentum. The wave function can represent different observables and it determines the distribution of possible results of measurement of those observables. In this episode, we'll be talking about the position wave function. Okay, pay attention to this bit of math. It'll be important. The square of the magnitude of this wave function tells us the probability distribution of a particle's position. The position that we observe when we look at the particle is picked randomly from that distribution. This step of squaring the wave function is called the Born Rule, and this innocuous seeming step introduces a simple symmetry that has profound implications. Let's see what happens when we square the wave function. The wave function is an oscillation in quantum possibility moving through space and time. It's no simple wave, it's literally complex in the mathematical sense. It has two components, one real and one imaginary. These components oscillate in sync with each other, but their offset shifted in phase by a constant amount. Phase is just the wave's current state in its up-down oscillation. 
When we apply the Born rule, what we're doing is squaring these two waves and adding them together. But it turns out that this value doesn't depend on phase. The magnitude squared of the real and imaginary components stays the same, even as those components move up and down. It's that magnitude squared that we can observe. It determines the particle's position. The phase itself is f So I kind of want to highlight something like, yeah, because a lot of people, if you're kind of like just a layman trying to understand this and you hear complex. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> uh, it doesn't like, or, or like imaginary numbers. Like, yeah, yeah. What the hell? You're do like, you? I'm out. <laughs> why the hell would I might that's what I would feel, felt when I was a kid I was like why the hell am I learning about imaginary yeah. numbers <laughs> are all numbers imaginary I mean yeah like aren't I imagining th these horrible things? names <laughs> god just that's my one th I, I guess that's kind of my my, my biggest gripe with math and physics they yeah. kind of pick the terminology they choose is just so head scratching it's like what <laughs> Who decided this? <laughs> anyway, imaginary numbers are not, um, they're, they're like a real thing that we use. The Imaginaries name does make sense though in some sense because sometimes imaginary numbers are like, they don't manifest in real life, right? Because like if you imagine if we have a wave function that has imaginary components, you're never gonna, like you don't know what getting an imaginary result is. You're not gonna ever get imaginary results. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to square it to make it into a real result. So it's like there's it's almost weird like how it works out, and the whole history of it is actually even interesting too because you know you know it developed from well that's what the um, Born rule is right like you have to do that otherwise your results don't make sense you have yeah. to square it. yeah yeah but it's interesting that yeah anyway it is interesting it is interesting I will fundamentally yes the, um, the fundamental aspect of it is that basically it comes from we wanted to see what number if you squared a number would give you a negative number back mm -hmm. which there's nothing that really does that so they created a they created a system where you can square two number or you can square a number to give you a negative number back yeah and that's where it all began yeah, I guess the people in antiquity, like the Greeks, would have like scoffed at imaginary numbers. Yeah, the, well, I think people dismiss it for a long time, and then they started yeah. to actually use it and notice that it actually had some useful properties. They're, they're like square root of negative one. <laughs> square root, you can't. What's what's that? Square rooting a negative? <laughs> yeah, they probably just killed you. Yeah, in the Pythagorean in the Pythagorean uh, cult, yeah, they would have killed. Right, you. they killed the guys for. Uh, for finding irrational numbers in the Pythagorean days, they're like, okay, he's got to die now. <laughs> Did they really? Yeah, some, guy, oh, some like they killed people because they found an irrational number or something. Because they were basically a cult back then, you know, yeah. the Pythagorean cult. They had the yeah. um, little like triangle, or whatever, or something inscribed yeah. in their hands. They, they were super married to symmetry, right? Yeah, I'm talking yeah. shit now, so I don't know exactly the history, yeah. but. They definitely, uh, some guy got marked for finding irrational numbers <laughs> or finding like the square root of two is irrational or something. <laughs> so well, math yeah. can be deadly. It can. <laughs> so weird how, yeah. But, but I mean like, yeah. So and luckily in modern days, we're a little bit more open. <laughs> Are the, we? <laughs> well, well, I guess we like to think we're a little Maybe bit more Maybe it's just open. so esoteric that people can't get raged out when they uh, hear new math. They're just like, oh, ah, yeah. leave the nerds their presence. They'll figure you know? it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, true. Um, but yes, yeah, so let's keep going here. I just wanted to clarify that. Fundamentally unobservable. You can shift phase by any amount, and you wouldn't change the resulting position of the particle as long as you do the same shift to both the real and imaginary components. In fact, as long as you make the same shift across the entire wave function, all observables are unchanged. We call this sort of transformation a global phase shift, and it's analogous to transforming our altitude zero point up or down by the same amount everywhere. The equations of quantum mechanics have what we call global phase invariance. Global phase is a gauge symmetry of the system. Let's push a little further to see how far this symmetry goes. 
This time we'll shift the phase by different amounts at different locations while still keeping the real and imaginary shifts the same at each location. This position dependent phase shift is called a local phase shift instead of a global phase shift. We'll try this because, well, we already know that the magnitude squared of the wave function should still stay the same under local phase shifts. Let's see what this would look like. A global phase shift looks like this, where all points move by the same amount. However, if we do a local phase shift, say only this point here, only that location changes as if it were part of the shifted wave, making a discontinuous spike. If you allow this sort of local phase shift, you can change each point in a different way and really mess up the wave function. That shouldn't change our probabilities for the positions of the particles, but what about observables besides position? According to the basic Schrodinger equation, we just ruined everything. Among other things, messing with local phase really screws up our prediction for the particle's momentum. See, momentum is related to the average steepness of the wave function. Change the shape of that wave function with local phase shifts and you actually break conservation of momentum. Yeah, and the reason why that oh, is is because Yeah, and the reason why that is is cuz like, you know, well, when we do derivatives, we typically have smooth and continuous functions. Right. We don't right. like these little shifts in the in the function. Yeah, discontinuities equal a non-smooth function equals now you have pockets where you can't take derivatives, and that's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> you want a whole function to go into derivative, and you want a whole function to come out of the derivative. You can't just be taking pieces of it, because then it just makes your derivative really unwieldy, because then it means you have to break it up into sections or something along those lines, mm -hmm. and it yeah. becomes nasty. But it's probably more realistic, right? Because in, in reality, we don't really have these like perfectly smooth functions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but of course, uh, you know, every physicist just wants reality to be just completely sine waves and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these perfect geometrical structures. And then yeah. you kind of just deal with real life as you have to do, you know, as it comes, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's what left physicists scratching their head, like historically, like they were just like, well, I mean, the realistic picture is that we don't have perfect these functions kind of do have maybe they do have local phase shifts mm. maybe they're discontinuous in certain parts how do we deal with that like that picture well we can't use a momentum operator because well like it's getting the our math so is gonna I, break down so i imagine then Juan, this has to do with the whole local um the whole local um what do you call it the whole local uh symmetry or whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of um Yang Mills theory or gauge theories, mm -hmm. I guess, in general, um, where they are, they do have this local invariance as well as this global invariance. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand what that means. So this video was pretty interesting. I, I, I haven't watched this one yet, but that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know how they get away with that. Mm. <laughs> but Oh, you're in luck. Okay. You're in luck because they're not done yet. Okay. <clears throat> this is how physicists, uh, so physicists saw this and they were like, well, what the hell? What do we do? Uh, local phase is not a gauge symmetry of the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. How do we fix this? Um, <clears throat> and I guess like if, if you're kind of confused about what the hell that sentence means, right? <laughs> local <laughs> phase is not a gauge symmetry. Go back to what we were saying about being gauge invariant and stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Think back to that and um, that's where you'll find your answer. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll keep going. Local phase is not a gauge symmetry of the basic Schrodinger equation. Okay, that was a bust. I guess we're done here. All right, wait just a second. Just for funsies, maybe we can change the Schrodinger equation to find a version that really is invariant to local phase shifts. To do that, we need to alter the part of the Schrodinger equation that gives us the momentum of our particle, the momentum operator. After all, momentum is what got screwed up. It turns out that we can add a mathematical term to the momentum operator that's specially designed to undo any mess we make to the phase of the wave function. If we tune this term correctly, it absorbs any local changes we make to the phase. And what is that extra term? Well, it's something we call a vector potential. I won't go into that right now, but the important and absolutely bizarre thing about this mathematical entity is that it looks like something very familiar. 
It looks exactly like the type of vector potential that you would have in the presence of an electromagnetic field. So we've discovered that the only way for particles to have local phase invariance is for us to introduce a new fundamental field that pervades all of space. And it turns out that field already exists and it's the electromagnetic field. This is totally crazy. We just rediscovered electromagnetism by insisting on a gauge symmetry that we had no right to expect to exist in the first place. But we didn't just rediscover the EM field, we learned a ton about it. By discovering how it fits into the Schrodinger equation, we've unlocked its quantum behavior. And now we know how it interacts with particles of matter to give them this symmetry. We also learned about the origin of electric charge, which we now see as a coupling term. Any particle that has this kind of charge will interact with and be affected by the electromagnetic field and be granted local phase invariance. But the reverse is also true. In order to have this particular type of local phase invariance, particles must possess electric charge. By the way, applying Noether's theorem tells us there is a conserved quantity associated with any symmetry. In this case, the symmetry is local phase invariance and the conserved quantity is electric charge. At this point, we only need a couple of extra steps to produce the full description of electromagnetism in the quantum world, quantum electrodynamics, or QED. First, we need yeah. to upgrade the Schrodinger equation. Crazy. Yeah. Damn. So that <laughs> Did we do that in class? No. Okay, man. So you can even do gauge transformations in quantum mechanics. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is kind of a more... Mo this is, mo th But this is why, because it's a more... Um, this is more quantum field theory. Okay. Yeah. Which I did not get to. Yeah. We. Yeah. Damn, I feel like I missed. I'm missing a lot from <laughs> the, doing the, quantum mo field the, mo theory. the modern nuggets of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like all of modern physics. So if you guys want to get to the modern world, if you're doing physics, mm -hmm. just go all the way to quantum theory and probably go to Yang Mills too, if you can. It seems that's the key to really be able to do leading edge stuff. Yeah, because it takes I mean, forever. But I know because we're kind of stuck. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't do quantum field theory, your physics knowledge is really stuck at uh what the before times like <laughs> no 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 it's like your your you're knowledge is kind of stuck if you've done condensed matter maybe your knowledge is is par to the 1960s <laughs> yeah right? well, we could get away with our knowledge doing like real life stuff because we're yeah. experimentalists right mm -hmm. so we don't need to go super deep in the theory we're yeah. not trying to do grand unified theories and shit the only right. reason we even got into this stuff is because of the podcast right yeah, yeah. but i realized that yeah if you want to really be on the leading edge you got to pretty much be in like the particle physics world of yeah you know, true gauge theories and transformations and quantum field theory and that kind of stuff yeah condensed matter physics is kind of aren't on the leading edge i think well in terms of like grand unified theories no not grand unified theories but we do need we do use gauge theories yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it won't be entirely lost, but okay. If you, yeah, we do, we do use uh, sort of um, what is it called? Group symmetry stuff, like yeah, uh, algebra, Lie algebra stuff. I imagine you could use that everywhere, but I think mm -hmm. probably the particle physicists are the most leading edge in terms of mm -hmm. understanding the basic fundamental model of the universe. Yeah, but um, that that's basically fundamentally why you get your standard. Um, or how you get your the, the more accurate picture of the standard model. Yeah. Because you have, like they were saying, this field that permeates. Right, right. That, that corrects field. all of the local phase shifts. Yeah. Very interesting. So you can just throw in that vector potential, boom, money. <laughs> and and that vector potential is a, is, a, is a gauge. Like it's it it sort of takes care. You can choose the the vector potential Yeah. because it's arbitrary. It's like, Right. Just choose yeah. it to fix your local... Faces, yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting, cool, yeah. man, cool. But uh, but hopefully that kind of ties a bigger picture, um, and that and that has to do with the Yang Mills because uh, here we go, hold on, we have to go back to Yang Mills here, yeah. Um, <clears throat> because like we were saying, you have um this uh connection and then you have this uh right the curvature stuff and the connection right. is really important because like the math says um it is the thing i, I mean i'm, I'm just take the quote out from here mm -hmm. uh 
the connection actually determines nearly all the other quantities in the equations. Um, and yeah, so it, it's literally, it gives you the physical description of, of, uh, of the, the, of your, whatever you want to find. Like, right. Yeah. Like it's responsible for the parallel transport, which is being able to translate ten, tangent vectors yeah. across space. And that, I think that connects the two different regions. If you mm -hmm. have some kind of, let's say, some some particle in one region of space and another particle in another region of space, then you have those different local invariances in those two different places. Mm -hmm. The um, connection will tell you how those two are connected with one another. Yeah. And it gives you the kinetic motion as we were thinking back to Sean Carroll's picture. Like right. If you want to talk about the motion, the curvature. Right. Um, yeah. So you get a lot of information just from this gauge. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the sort of what your gauge looks like. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, I guess the I didn't even realize that Yang Mills is responsible for unifying all of the forces pretty much as well besides gravity. Explain. So Yang Mills theory is responsible for unifying the electroweak force you know, electricity and magnetism with the weak mm -hmm. force, as well as a strong force and the electromagnetic force. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the foundational theory for the standal, standard model Lagrangian. Oh, okay. So they, and it uses these things called special unitary groups, which is that those are the symmetries that are used for those different regimes. So in the electroweak theory, it utilizes, um, uh, SU2, which is the special unitary group two, and actually, that has to do with the Pauli matrices, I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. So the Pauli matrices are, they come about from that whole Yang-Mills um, special unitary group. And then um, for the uh, strong force, it uses the special unitary group three, which has to do with um, quantum chromo chromodynamics. And you can see the two, and you can remember the two and the three because, you know, the Pauli matrices, they have the two, the two by two matrices. Mm -hmm. The special unitary group three for the strong force has a three by three matrix, which has um, red, green, and blue, you know, because in quantum chromodynamics, there's an exchange of gluons and they call that, you know, they, they have color charge, you could say, which is red, green, and blue. Um, don't get too hung up on that, but yeah. it's, it's just the strong force mediates interactions really close to the nuclei, and that's what holds... Um, uh, holds these nucleons together basically mm -hmm. and the weak force is responsible for beta decay which is like how particles decay into other particles um, and then finally the electromagnetic force is a u1 symmetry which is a unitary group one and it's just a one you know it's just a scalar because you know charge charge uh Charge is always charge. You know, it's just, it's not going to change under any kind of um, translations. Yeah. So it's interesting. And that's all tied to Yang Mills. So they, and they describe the standard model Lagrangian as an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. If you guys listen to Eric Weinstein, he always talks about that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first time I actually heard of it. And um, yeah, so actually this is interesting too. Is one of the reasons we even wanted to do this Yang Mills is because it ties to Eric's theory, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when we when we did the last week's podcast on Eric Weinstein, you know, we didn't realize there's so much, so much math <laughs> you got to know about this stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, because what? We need to know topology. We need to know differential geometry. You need to know group theory. You need to know, um, it would help to know quantum field theory, Yang Mills theory. It's like all this stuff you kind of need to really know how to tackle, you know, yeah, these leading edge GUTs and TOEs. Yeah, <laughs> that's at least a year's worth of. Uh, I Bro, mean, for us, year, where we're at, a year seems ambitious to me. No, I'm thinking I'm like saying, two years. No, a semester. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking of like a semester. Like imagine if you. But that's like going hard. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to. <laughs> I would die if I had to take all those <laughs> in a year. No, I mean, like, no, because, like, realistically, you could take um, differential geometry if you want. I don't think yeah. math, I don't think physicists have any business taking those math classes, but. Well, no, because differential geometry is related to general relativity. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, you don't need to take a standalone 
uh, class. Oh, I see. You can get yeah. it at GR. You can get in GR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, because you get introduced to tensors and stuff like that. The language that you need mm. to talk about uh, G, uh, calculus on 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 surfaces or manifolds, you get it from GR for the most right. part. Yeah. I guess if you wanted to shortcut it all, let's say if you wanted to do like um, Yang, Yang Mills and get to it, I guess just do gauge theory because I guess gauge theory ties in that group theory with um, topology mm -hmm. in some sense. If you if you get it geometry, I guess into mm -hmm. geometry parts of it, um, and then what? I guess maybe like what would you say is the most important to get a Yang Mills? I would say probably gauge theory and quantum field theory. Um, well, it builds into quantum field theory. I yeah, think. that's why I think it's relevant though. If you're trying if you're trying to get to the leading edge physics of today. Oh, well, then I think you would need gauge we'll take theory GR, and quantum we'll field take, theory. And yeah, Mills. take take if you're a physics student, take general relativity. Take um Well I'm assuming you already had that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, if you're just supplementing then yeah. uh then maybe you can do some reading. I mean the books that were recommended um <clears throat> were uh I guess I shouldn't assume general relativity, right? Because <laughs> uh, then I should assume not. quantum field theory. Yeah, because, I mean, all we need to take, we could jump into quantum field theory now. Yeah, yeah. Like, with the knowledge that we have, and yeah, we we're could. expected to right. be able to learn. But we can jump into all those. We could jump into topology, quantum field theory, yeah. and, well, except Yang Mills, we wouldn't. We could do gauge theory, Well, because it's too. purely math, but yeah. Well, because Yang Mills depends on all of those other ones. This is why we're struggling to do the podcast on Yang Mills now. <laughs> well, I'm saying, like, the theory, the theory is built on... A lot of the math that we know. Which one? Yang Mills? Yeah, because, I mean, they talk about, like, if we're going to cut the language. Yeah, it's... but they also have a lot of terms. The thing is, like, the topology aspect is very numerous. Michael Nielsen, in his introduction, also addresses this. Like, there's a ton of terms we don't know. And there's operators, like the Hodge star operator, where, mm -hmm. with, which I'm not familiar at all. Um, like, there's, there's a right. bunch of topology stuff in here that I don't know that you need to know. You need to know like diffeomorphisms. Um, it helps if you do it. So from a, from a geometry point of view, this mm -hmm. is when the fiber bundle stuff starts coming as well, mm -hmm. which we don't really know. Gotcha. So if you don't know any fiber bundles, covector spaces, tangent vector spaces, um, diffeomorphisms, isomorphisms, all this stuff is becomes relevant in Yang Mills gotcha. from a geometric interpretation. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you really want to learn, I, Apparently, this Michael Nielsen here, yeah. he said he learned it all from this book, Gauge Fields, Knots, and Gravity by John Bayes, uh -huh. B-A-E-Z. And, and John Bayes is on Twitter. Yeah, and Javier P. Munayan, M-U-N-I-A-I-N. -N. We actually have <clears throat> a claim to fame with John Bayes. Well, not us, but we know that um, Dylan Berger got unfollowed from John Bayes because... Um, he advertised a desk on his Twitter. <laughs> he advertised a desk? Yeah, John Bayes got all butt hurt because um, Dylan advertised a desk on Twitter. <laughs> Why would he get upset about that? Um, because it wasn't a disclosed ad or something. Oh, interesting. So he thought he was being a corporate shill. <laughs> I'm like, Cor bro, you realize that Dylan's a graduate student who probably makes $20,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John. I think it's okay. Well, John, thank you uh, for this beautiful book. I guess people love it, um, yeah, and yeah. Th that's where I would suggest if you're a physics grad student watching this, or if you're an undergrad who's aspiring to uh, learn quantum field theories, check out the mm -hmm. gauge fields, knots, and gravity. Uh, that's supposed to lead you down this rabbit hole to be able to even appreciate Yang Mills. Yeah, but I would also recommend just checking out this Michael Nielsen intro mm -hmm. first because it was yeah. really enlightening to me. Yeah, simplified things in such a nice way. If you don't know anything, mm -hmm. um, I also posted it on my Twitter. If you guys want to check it out there, yeah, if it's not too late. Um, and and yeah. yeah, and I think we're done. If if uh, did you have any finishing touches? Ooh, I guess. Um, well, I if did you, want to get into tensors, but yeah, yeah, we don't yeah. have time to do if that. You, if you guys have any, um, especially people who know gauge theory or any of these kind of group theory concepts or topology, 
If you guys have any other comments to add to this video, please, by all means. Uh, or resources that you think are good. Yeah, yeah leave, leave it in the comments. And, um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions, too, you know, maybe we can answer them. I mean, this is this was a tough one for us to tackle. We've been <laughs> we've been trying to hit these really like big mon, uh, monster topics lately. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, we did at least some justice to it. But of course, if you're a real specialist, you may not get that much from it. But right. this is mostly for laymen and you know undergraduates, early grads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please. Hopefully, we did something for you. Yeah, please like, <laughs> comment, share, subscribe. Uh, check out. Uh, our webpage at eigenbros.com. Yes. Our Twitter at eigenbros. Uh, I think we're also on TikTok, eigenbros too. Yep. Eigenbros uh, on Instagram. Yeah. Thanks again to the patrons once again. Thank you. And if you guys want to become Patreon members, check us out, patreon.com slash eigenbros. Mm -hmm. Support your boys, three, uh, 30 minute podcasts every week. At least. On random bullshit. <laughs> at least. <laughs> All right, folks. And we'll see you later. Sayonara. Peace.